Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Dennis Kine. He has a very interesting story to tell. He was in the military from 1988 to 2003. Went through a lot of the military escapades of the U.S. government, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, etc. And he has written a book. The book is titled Support the Truth. And also he is on the website Courage to Resist. Uh, talking about the Gulf War on the first part of that series. So you can check out courage to resistorg and listen to him talk about uh, his experience. But he's also going to talk about that uh, tonight on the show. So, Dennis, are you there? Yes, good to be with you. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, agreeing to the interview. So for people who haven't heard your name, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you ended up in the military and uh, in Iraq particularly? Yes, definitely. Um my name is Dennis Kine, of course, as you mentioned, and I was born in the, the Bay Area, uh, Northern California, and I, was not, I wasn't born into poverty or I wasn't really grown up, you know, overly impoverished, but money for college wasn't something that, uh, you know, we just had laying around, and I took a look at the GI Bill and the Army College Fund, and I thought that was going to be my shot at, you know, getting a college education, so I enlisted into the military in January of 1987, and... Um, graduated from high school and ended up going into the military uh, after I graduated and um, got assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia out of, uh, I went to Fort Benning, Kentucky for basic, Fort Sam Houston for medical training and then I went to Fort Benning for airborne school and stayed there uh, for the duration of uh, that time until Operation Desert Storm started in August of 1990. So on Fort Benning, Georgia, you'll see the home of the infantry, the School of America is where we train uh, soldiers from the Central American armies and uh, and uh, airborne rank school, and not just exposed to a lot of that uh, that hardcore uh, infantry training. And then the unit I was assigned to was the first medical unit deployed to Operation Desert Shield after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. And uh, when he conducted that invasion, we were uh, heavily vaccinated and, and, and went through the drills of, of, of getting prepared for combat immediately and uh, were sent to the Middle East. So that's basically a couple years of uh, you know peacetime military on Fort Benning and then right into combat where uh, I served with uh, the 44th Medical Brigade, uh, the 24th Infantry Division, and under the 18th Airborne Corps. We were uh, what they call the... Uh, the 18th Airborne Corps was lined up on the on the uh, Iraqi border, the Saudi Arabia Iraqi border, and the 7th Corps, which would come from Germany, they were lined up on the border of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So uh, we got there in August after having been vaccinated with uh, anthrax vaccines. They were loaded with squalene, which is an adjutant to speed up the process of the vaccine, and uh, we were given, you know, a number of other vaccinations and loaded right onto troop. Uh, aircraft and then moved through uh, Canada and Germany into the Middle East where we stayed in a place called Cement City and uh, we stayed there for six weeks like that uh, waiting for our vehicles to get there because they put our vehicles on ships so we flew there our vehicles weren't there when we got there so we stayed in the cement cement factory basically they called Cement City where we ingested heavy medical particles from the cement factory and we basically lived uh, in an environment that um you know, heavily populated, but not overly hygienic. And so uh, people were getting sick, and we were breathing in sand. And so uh, when you breathe in sand, you get dysentery because the body can't uh, body can't digest the sand, so you just immediately get diarrhea. So now we had lo- been loaded up with vaccines. We were breathing in heavy medical part heavy metal particles from the uh, cement factory, and uh, we were breathing in sand that was causing us dysentery. So we started seeing heavy, heavy duty uh, heat casualties real early. And um, then we um, started moving forward. Our job was to set up the camps. As you move forward to what they would call the D line, the departure line of where the war would start, which is essentially the border of Iraq, we were responsible for setting up basically camps. They would become the forward camp until you moved on to the next camp we were going to build, and we would put up uh, the latrines. And uh, we would put up all the facilities so that the troops that were coming in behind us could just drive right up to the front and stop in these base camps along the way, essentially. 
So when we set up these camps, you could, uh, you know, run into, you know, poisonous vectors and rodents because everything living in the desert is pretty much poisonous. So they would just lace the area with herbicides and pesticides and vectorcides and whatever else to kill these rodents. And then we would just kick them up all day while we were working in them. So uh, we were just getting exposed to these elements all the way through. And then as we got all the way through the front line, you know, they ordered us to order, uh, eat what was called pyristigmid bromide tablets. And uh, this would be referred to as PB tablets. And uh, those were in, in to uh, block off our synapses. In our, you know, we have nerve endings in the synapses so that if we ingested a chemical or a biological agent, they wouldn't rip through our, rip through our nerves. It was really a weird, weird idea. And um, the drug had never been approved by the FDA. Nobody had ever seen it before. It was Dutch made. And um, we ate them, and I projectile vomited immediately. My body knows it's not supposed to take it. I was taught that when I was a young man, that if, if your body doesn't not want to ingest it, then you shouldn't ingest it. But some of the kids, they thought more of the better, so they'd eat two or three packs of these things if they could. And uh, those kids all got, you know, a lot of brain damage and then other, you know, uh, mental mental issues from that. And uh, then then the war started, and that started on January 17th, 1991. And uh, that is where we bombed, uh, you know, southern Iraq and in and, and, and that territory for 45 days with the A-10 Warthog tank buster. It's going to fire something like 2,600 and 2,000 rounds, 2,200 rounds a minute or something. And it just ripped depleted uranium all the way through there. And uh, then we invaded and our guys walked right in, you know. And, right. uh, and uh, that's pretty much essentially, you know, a rundown of all the contaminants, you know, we, we were working with, to, which would later be referred to as Gulf War Syndrome. Right. Yeah, I remember that. But there was also like this, pro- this fear that this was going to be an equal war and that Saddam Hussein had, you know, a massive amount of troops and the Iraqi army was the third largest in the world if you remember things that were published in time or things like that so uh-huh. uh, it was pretty ramped up i mean they had the kind of propaganda laid out very well when in fact when you guys rolled in some people called it a turkey shoot would you agree with that well it was a turkey shoot because we were running with those m1a1 abrams tanks you know we this was a tank war it wasn't you know we weren't inside of uh we hadn't gone to cat or to uh basra or we weren't in Baghdad or Fallujah, right? That was all 2003. So 1991, we were engaging in straight tank battles. You know, T-72s and T-55s were running up against our M1A1 Abrams. And the M1A1, you could stand next to that Abrams tank and not even know it's running. That's how quiet it is. And it was also the first war we were loaded up with uh, GPS and night vision goggles. I mean, we had all that stuff. So... Uh, the, the Iraqis weren't holding any of that technology, so the, the tanks could be right on top of the, the enemy that quickly and have them surrounded. Um, one of the things that, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the deal is, is that the Iraqi troops had fought in a seven-year war against Iran. You know, the Iran-Iraq war lasted seven years, and like millions of guys got killed in that thing. So they were a hardened military. You know, so while it was a turkey shoot in the, in the tank battles, right, we went down into Kafji, the Marines were in there, and they got whooped. So in, in your urban environment, and your small arms combat zones, the guys were getting their asses kicked. So a lot of people don't know that. And if we were going to go try to occupy Baghdad or go try to occupy, we weren't ready for it. We were just kids. Man, I was 21 years old. I didn't, hadn't done anything but play tackle football, right? So when we crossed the D-Day, we as medics, one of the things we became responsible for was POWs. So... I would uh, have conversations with these prisoners, or you know the Bay Area, that uh, there's a lot of, of uh, Spanish speakers in, in the Bay Area. I learned to speak Spanish when I was a kid. Uh, the Spaniards tried to colonize the Middle East long ago, so I would speak Spanish with a lot of these Iraqi soldiers because they could speak Spanish. So uh, what, I, what I found out was a lot of these guys were in their late 30s and early 40s, right, and they were men, and they, they weren't afraid, and they were just laughing at us, really. Because they knew in the ground battle, if we, you know, we, our, our, our equipment was solid, but there was no way we were going to be able to take over those cities. And that's the main reason we didn't, you know, when I, when I got ordered on January 17th, you know, the war started, and then the invasion came, we were told, we're going all the way to Baghdad. You troops will be going to Baghdad. You won't know the guy on your left is dead. The guy on the right might die. You might not ever see him again. They gave us a steak dinner like it was the last meal. 
and we hit the D-Day, right? Mm-hmm. But, man, we were running into wadis, right? If you've ever seen the, uh, the Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence, and he's, he's done in that quicksand, we always called it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's real. It's called a wadi, W-A-D-I, and the definition of it is a free-flowing river in Arabia. So the Euphrates River runs right down from Baghdad all the way, you know, all the way down, and these wadis kick off of it. And we were just getting sunk, stunk, sunk in them. Our, our vehicles were literally just going in there. So now an A1A1, M, M, the A1A1 tank is amphibious. It could move through the sand and the water and all of it, but our trucks that were bringing the, the, the water and the fuel and all that couldn't. So there was no way we were going to make this assault all the way to Baghdad, and that was is what they later on referred to as the end run, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so all, all they did was change their, 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 the story of, of what really happened, which was our incompetence and our lack of intelligence didn't, didn't tell us that we could even make it through these – these wadis, we made the right turn and we ran into what was later referred to as the highway of death. Right. Because what we really thought we were going to do was get on that highway that runs right up and down the re- river. It runs right up and down the Euphrates like that. They run together. We thought we were going to get on that freeway and drive to Baghdad on the freeway, but we had already melted it with the uranium and there was no way we could do it. So that's why the ceasefire got called. Interesting. And it was what kind of a grand kind of pincher movement left to right, kind of encircled the troops in Kuwait headed by Schwarzkopf, right? Is that kind of how well, it would yeah. Well, that's how it would be penned. But you okay. got to remember now, the most important thing about bringing Schwarzkopf into this conversation is that Schwarzkopf didn't want to invade. Schwarzkopf had always built a, a military position there that was to defend Saudi Arabia. That was his whole position. It was never to go on the offensive. Gotcha. He had been, his father was the general in the Middle East, and he became the general. He was like royalty in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and he wrote a book called It Doesn't Take a Hero, which basically explains everything. He really did a great job of it, and I think it also explains why he didn't run for president. But he was telling Bush, he's like, look, we do not want to fight these guys. This is a million-man army, and they just got done fighting seven years, and they're bad. They're tough. And so he said, I won't do it unless you bring me the matching army to match up with them. There's no way we can go on the offensive you know, with, with what we're setting up here. So that's why it took eight months to to actually invade. We started in August, but it took us it, it took us all that time for Schwarzkopf to get a military. He felt to get the job done. And um, so when we went on the offensive, Schwarzkopf, I don't think he'd ever devised a military strategy to go in. You know, I don't think he was. I don't think he was very prepared for it. And um, I don't think he really wanted to. I don't think his heart was in it either. And I think if you ever read his book, you know, it doesn't take a hero. He's basically saying the 24th infantry division was the front line and that was the division i was in and and i can you know from my experience i tell you man we were not really prepared to take care of it and still you know 12 years later and now what what are we talking about 30 years later we still never really got the job quite done you know yeah i mean but that's really the kind of seed or the thing that started off the real iraq war in 2003 was that whole situation of supposedly goading Saddam Hussein to invade Iraq, uh, Kuwait, excuse me, and then, you know, George Bush Sr. grandstanding and saying this shall not stand, and it's kind of like right. they were stuck, George Bush stuck himself into a, uh, a war situation. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes, and I, and I think if you if we do the retrospect, you know, being an oil family, and uh, I think Saddam's plan at the time you know, he had a justification, and he explained it why he invaded Kuwait, but he was also trying to get ready to take the oil off the dollar, too. I think he was going to go put it on another standard, and there was a whole other conversation about oil. Very, It was the beginning of these oil conversations. Kuwait was slant drilling in the Iraq for oil, and right. um, there, was in, there was a Kuwaiti of Amir's um, niece who came and testified in Congress. Right, that's famous, that the right? Iraqi soldiers... Yeah. Yeah, she was. In, they were in the hospital. They were ripping out the incubators and killing all the babies. And Congress fell for it. Now, okay, man, we got to go in there and save the babies. But that later came out to be fraud. You know, that girl was not even anybody of anybody, and it was just a total smoke. <laughs> yeah, I thought she was related so that, to one of the ruling families in Kuwait, and she was a great actress. Like, no, no, I think she had the the family connection, but I don't think. She, but her evidence in terms of the uh, yeah, totally the incubators was was faulty. Yeah. I can't hear you. No, it was totally fake. You're right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, you're coming in a little louder now. Yeah. Um. So, then, so you made it into you know there was a ceasefire. Then what happened? And 
I mean, there's such a long story about this Gulf War syndrome. So many people came sick. There's hundreds of thousands of people, uh, military people, who came down with all kinds of different strange ailments. Can you describe that? Absolutely. Well, yeah, and I'll tell you, if you want to watch the documentary, it's called Beyond Trees, and Joyce Riley did it. She was a, a real, you know, kind of a deep, deep diving journalist, like or investigative, you know, uh, reporter kind of person, kind of in the vein of the stuff you're covering. And um, she did a documentary with William Lewis, and it basically outlines uh, uh, all of the, the types of experiences that they've done on the soldiers in terms of, um, you know, uh, you know, the vaccinations to the depleted uranium to the bromide tablets. And um, the, the soldiers' experience really was right from the beginning. You know, one of the ones that people don't know that happened to us back then was that the, they call it the, the term is used stop loss now, but when I when I was when I was at stop loss, it was called involuntary extension. Hmm. So I was scheduled to, to elapse my service in January of of 1991. That would have been my my I would have been up for my three years of service, active duty, and they involuntarily extended me for as long as they needed me, and that was something I had no idea was even possible when I was at the recruiter. Um, so that's a lot of times that, you know, they, they don't really tell you what you're getting into, but when you do enlist in the military, you enlist for eight years, everybody does. It's just, you do three on active. And then after that, you have five more you're obligated for if they need you. They just don't make that real clear in the recruiting station. Interesting. So I was like, Whoa, Whoa, what do you mean? I'm supposed to get out. You know, I'm, what do you mean I'm not getting out? <laughs> they don't know you're, and then, then somebody explains to you how your contract works, and you go back and you look at it, and it says, "Whoa, it does! It says eight years right in this thing, man. How did I, how did I, how did I actually miss it? Or you know, you just feel so used and lied to by then that, uh, you know, the war hasn't even started yet, right? Um, right. So, you're really you're losing faith in your whole the whole system. But the the deal is, is when you're in a combat situation, all you got are the guys around you, and you just try to survive it. But um, you know, uh, and when I came home, I was I was against the war when we were in it. And I've been against the war, you know, pretty much my whole life for the most part, just being from where I'm from. And I lost a lot of friends because of it, because they, you know, they stayed in the military or they uh, they believed in what we were doing. But um, I I just uh, you know those kind of experiences really just maybe they broke my heart to be frank with you. Well, you're not alone. I think that's not uncommon for a lot of frontline troops there. They became disillusioned, especially in the second, you know, the true Iraq war um, in 2003, I think, getting to that. But what did you do in between the end of Desert Storm and um, Operation Iraqi Freedom or whatever they called it back in 2003? Um, when I came home from Desert Storm, I... Uh moved off Fort Benning and went to drill sergeant, the drill sergeant academy at Camp Parks and graduated from there and spent, I'm going to call it three and a half, four years, um, with the 91st infantry division, which would become the 104th infantry division. And I was a drill sergeant on Fort Bliss, Texas and Fort Sill, Oklahoma, training privates there. And that would essentially be kind of the end of my career. I was a young E5. I was in my twenties, right? And I volunteered for drill sergeant school, which is not something most people do. And um, I went in there as an E5. I was real young, and I, and I was the only one with a combat patch on my shoulder. And then I, then I started watching them abuse the privates, and I was like, whoa, man, you're going to abuse these guys. This isn't going to do anything for them in combat. And so I kind of was like a Serpico of the drill sergeants, right? So that just wrecked my career for real. You know, I was like, wow, I'm really done. But when, I was still, just, you know, messed up and, and a believer. <laughs> right, but when you, during that drill sergeant, would you agree that they were doing that to break down the troops to make them more malleable? Because I remember a study that happened back in World War One, where a certain proportion of the soldiers that went to Europe would not shoot. And they instituted things within the armed forces to make them more aggressive or more willing to follow orders to shoot the enemy. Do you think that that, that uh, basic training and the subjection of the drill sergeant to the troops is is furthering that goal oh yeah i mean you set me up perfectly so uh lieutenant colonel grossman dan grossman wrote a book called on killing where he basically outlined specifically what you just said and um he was a uh, he was the he ran the rotc program and he was a psychologist 
professor at the university he was at, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, that, just like you said, in World War One, the, the soldier would not go down range. Less than like one, I think one percent or something, they said, would go down range and engage the enemy and then fire at him and kill him, because the human nature is not to kill people, right? Right. But by the time Vietnam, the Vietnam War had hit, and they got these automatic weapons and they got this psychological stuff going on in basic. They, uh, he basically indicates in his book, he says, man, they're using uh, Pavlovian techniques. They're using Skinner techniques, all the stuff they've been studying on the human mind for years. And Milgram, you know, which is basically authoritative uh, right. studies. And, um, and no, no lie, man. I mean, you'll start seeing it uh, immediately. And, and remember, I'm a young kid. I'm, I'm playing a lot of this back now at 51 years old. But back then, I didn't realize I was the bell in the Pavlovian study, right? The drill sergeant is the bell. We're the one yelling kill, and then the other guy goes kill. We yell kill. They yell kill, and we ring the bell, and they salivate. Right. So. Right. Well, um, the Mil- the Milgram experience. You know, like, yeah. yeah, the Milgram uh, experiment of administering pain is almost like something like the military, where the overseers tell you to just keep inflicting the pain. You know, it's almost like a perfect metaphor for a frontline troop. Somebody telling you over there to go out and kill. People don't know that. That's the experiment. Oh, yeah. yeah. The experiment where the psychologist yeah, says just keep administering the pain even though the guy in the next room is screaming all the time so anyway well that's what you're describing is like what daryl anderson he was uh, he did a tour over there got a purple heart and he said man i had a sergeant right next to me telling me to shoot these people in a car and he's i mean it's all happening right in front of him he elects not to he says i ain't shooting them and then it turns out to be a, mo- a woman and a kid just coming through their checkpoint and he's like, look, Sarge, that, man, those people didn't need to be dead. And he's like, but I told you to kill him. So he was in trouble, right? Right. And um, he d- became a resistor, and they tried to send him back for a second tour. And, you know, he went to Canada. But just that experience for a young man who – his situation was he came right out of basic training and went to the battlefield. So basically, when you're in basic training, you're a trainee. And then they sent him from trainee to combat. That's not that he's not a soldier yet. They say it takes two years to actually develop a soldier. He's just still a trainee, and they got him over there. Luckily, he hadn't been overly programmed, and he's like, "Man, this is nuts." But it's that 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 time in garrison, the two years on bedding, I'm telling you about that made me the hardened soldier. But when they just send trainees off to the battlefield, they usually run into a lot of problems with them over there. Interesting. So, how long did you spend as a drill sergeant? Um, I lasted, a, I'll say, right underneath two years, you know, struggling all the way through it before I, uh, I transferred out. And then, um, then I went into the, uh, the reserves and uh, the ready reserves, and then I made it all the way into a National Guard. I'm a guitar player, and I, uh, I wanted to keep my uniform. I wanted to stay in the uniform. I don't know why, but I said I'm going to go try out for the Army Band, uh, the 91st Infantry, which I've been in. They wouldn't take me, so I left the the the, mili- the army component went to the national guard component i was in the, i was a guitar player in the army band and then they reinvaded uh, iraq in 2003 and they were telling us that hey you, you musicians you're going to be military police and guard pow's when you're not doing a gig at night and i was like you're out of your mind i, I had to be a pow guard when i was a medic in 1991 and i don't even know what you guys are talking about and i uh, made a deal with my commander um, he was a chief warrant officer because the chiefs are the commanders in the bands. We don't have you know full blown uh, officers. I said, man, you don't want me to embarrass you. I don't. I don't want to embarrass you. You don't need a soldier on your rolls that uh, that uh, is embarrassing. You want you just transfer me. I had six months left in my on my contract, but I was smarter this time around, right? And I said, just transfer me into the individual ready reserve, and he did. And um, I'm so grateful to this day that he did, because who knows what kind of trouble I'd have gotten into or whatever, because I just became an immediate outspoken critic. When we when we went into Afghanistan, I could I'm not going to say I could have cared less, but it, the the tit for tat on the 9/11 and all that, I was like, okay, whatever that is. But when they started going after Iraq, it was when I really woke up and became really, really I was you know I became almost maladjusted. I became almost tyrannical about it because. I had watched the 2000 election of Al, you know, Gore and Bush, and I was like, black box voting, Supreme Court decisions, right. that doesn't look like the democracy that they taught me. And then when Bush just started manhandling everybody and started sending us off in these crazy wars, and I, I became a very active, um, 
human being against the war. I still had not been educated on the depleted uranium yet. I still hadn't sat down with the chemistry books and looked at it and tried to figure it all out yet at all. That was 03. So I'm 12 years off the battlefield. But I can tell you, in those 12 years, I'd heard stories of guys I was in the units with in, 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 um, you know, in the desert. Because uh, we in, in our unit, in our battalion, we had the dust offs, right? We had the helicopters that came in and picked patients up. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of these guys had skin melting all the way down to their bones, and they were telling us it was a skin-eating virus they must have contracted. But I would later learn and figure out that it was depleted uranium particles that were landing on their skin, and they were embedding them deeper into their skin with suntan lotion and, and shit like that. And so they, we were exposed to the fallout from these bombs, as well as the uh, internal radiation, you know, coming from from the gamma radiation, and uh, that all that knowledge didn't come to me until I had decided to sort of be a an anti-war guy. Right. Well, anti-war you're still dude. you're still enlisted at that time, correct? Two thousand three. Or right. Mean, yeah, right. yeah. I'm still enlisted, and I'm I'm also uh, waking up simultaneously. Right. Yeah. But like one really of the waking right. Up. One of the tricks is that the depletium depleted uranium isn't truly depleted. And they don't tell you they came, right. they came from a literal nuclear reactor and got repurposed into warheads on some of these weapons. Yeah, yeah. So uh, after – here's an interesting you know, tit for tat on the 91 to 2003. In 1991, we had a coalition, right? We had every military on the planet there with us, right? Right. When we reinvaded in 2003, Poland was the only country who said, we'll go with you. And so one of the reasons is like the French were saying, man, you, that stuff you're dropping in Iraq is so radioactive, it appears to be coming right off your, radio, right off your reactors or, or it's your nuclear waste. It's one or the other. It's not even just depleted uranium. I mean, this stuff right. is just so hot. We were, who knows what was really dumping, right? Because they, you don't. You're absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah, the depleted uranium is, uh, it's, it's, it's depleted of its fissionable part, right? Right, that's correct, yeah. That's what it's depleted of. It's depleted of the part that would go on later on to be put in a plutonium breeder to make plutonium out of. So plutonium's a man-made element. It's made out of that, like, less than 1% of the uranium that's actually fissionable. Right. So when a depleted uranium bomb actually drops, it behaves like a neutron bomb, right? A one-for-one exchange. Not a nuclear bomb, which is a one-for-three or greater exchange of, 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 of you know, of of a neutron so the new nu- we're basically dropping neutron bombs on right and many many neutron bombs and they're still having terrible birth defects and things like that throughout iraq i mean it's a really uh, just a nightmare what uh, what happened over there with the de- depleted uranium it's still a problem yeah you're right and kids would get out there and play in the metal some of them were recycling metal you know they'd go out and play on the blown out tanks and And, you know, the Highway of Death is an interesting story because we bombed that highway. It was a retreating convoy of not just Iraqi troops, but fleeing citizens and innocent civilians. And and when we ran into it, we we came back to the rear, and then the next group would go in, and we would dig trenches on the side of the roads and bury all of that. And they would tell us, well, Dennis, you know, we got to take care of it like that because, you know, Saddam's not going to clean that mess up. I'm like, this is so weird. What am I listening to? But... We were covering it up, man. We were we were taking all that radioactive waste and dumping it down in a ditch on the side of the road, and it's been there ever since. And that's why I was telling people, I go, hey, Lieutenant Aaron Watada, he was the only officer ever uh, to refuse to deploy to Iraq in 03, 04. Mm-hmm. And I testified at his, his hearings up in, in Washington, and I was like, look, he's, he's, he's right. He's a, he's a commander of troops. He leads troops. He should not lead them into a radioactive battlefield. It's still radioactive from 1991. And you're still using uranium, bombing it on them. So I mean, what what what, what are you trying to tell me, man? You're violating all kinds of, you know, uh, you know, uh, international law and everything. And and, and like, I'm, I'm sticking up for the LT on this one, man. What so, do you, you weren't know, the numbers of people exposed or people with Gulf War syndrome in the hundreds of thousands? I mean, it was a huge number. Oh yeah, it was huge, and it was early on. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I tell people there was a half a million of us on the front line when the war started. And I don't, I'll bet you won't meet three of us in your life. And there was another half a million that went in after us, you know, by, by over, the, over the course of, you know, 91 to 03, we did Operation Northern Watch. We did Operation Southern Watch. The, the Marines were big on Operation Desert Fox. I mean, they were doing maneuvers over there. So we've been engaged over there all the way through those sanctions that starved Iraq out for 10 right. years. 
Um, and, and, and they, you know, you couldn't get in, you couldn't get an aspirin in Iraq unless it came through Jordan. Jordan got rich, you know, just, you know, tapping on and, and, and moving water. You, you get a warm Pepsi in Iraq easier than a bottle of water. So, um, you know, we, we really did them dirty, you know, with those sanctions and then continuing. Clinton was bopping, drop, dropping bombs on them in Northern Watch and Southern Watch. All the presidents have been involved in it. None of them can sit this out. Right. And uh, we left a radioactive element. The element has a 4.2 billion year half life. That's longer than the human experience. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like the duration of the, the Earth or something. It's just an incredible number. Right. You have to look at it in cosmological terms. Do you remember when Saddam Hussein tried to put together that operation to kill George Bush Sr. in Kuwait? When was that? Do you recollect that story? I don't recollect that one, but I, is that the one that, that George Bush Jr. uses to, for his yes. invasion? Yes, that's yeah, why I asked. Yeah. So that's when I become, yeah, that's, I, that's basically, uh, I don't know enough about that scenario okay. to, to, I don't to speak to it. But I, I don't either. I've heard, I've heard it in the, in the circles you have, I think, too. But, though, but Bush, I can't ever get to. Bush Jr. said from the White House, he, he, in one interview, he says, they tried to kill my dad. So it may have been right, some kind right. of like the invasion may have been personal or had some personal element. I have to look into that, so I, 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 sadly I can't say I can speak to that. Um, so 2003 comes around. Then, then what happens uh, to you? I mean, when did the the Gulf War start the, under George Bush Jr.? There was 2003. Do you remember the date? Um, I'm thinking because we did a massive, massive event. So I, I'm thinking it's March 17th. 2003 is what we consider the, the beginning of what they call Gulf War II now. Gulf I don't know why they do that. But, um, you know, to me, it's all one war. I mean, we have all these different operations inside of it. But the way they define it is Gulf War One and Two. But that neglects Northern Watch, Southern Watch, Desert Fox, and whatever we're into now because, you know, I <laughs> mean, so, but yeah, Gulf War Two. I think, is pretty confirmed. I mean, we do some protesting. We're heavy on the streets in March. Of over three, March seventeenth, I think is the day he defines as the we define as the anniversary of Gulf War Two, and um, they start right off this time. Now, I remember ninety one, we bombed for forty five days, from January seventeenth to late February, and um, then we we marched into the radioactive area where guys would get sick and vomit and have the thousand yard stare. But this time in 03, when 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 they went in, they bombed and invaded simultaneously. It means the ground troops were moving as the bombs were dropping, which means they were walking in the radio, radiation from 1991 and the gamma radiation, the hardcore heavy gamma radiation that's coming off this this earth from the pounding of the uranium weapons that they're firing in 2003. And they are, I mean, it looked like, you see these little mini mushrooms popping over in Iraq on the news in 03. They're like right. those are like little mini nuke mushrooms, just little black clouds, and they were calling them, you know, uh, covering concealment. And I'm like, my ass, that isn't those aren't smoke grenades, man. But they oh, were I they heard, were knocking some things out. Yeah, didn't they mini nuke What's the that? the didn't they mini nuke the airport during the invasion because they were having trouble with it, trouble taking over the Baghdad airport? I think they mini nuked it. The U.S. did. I would I, I refer to that I love the term and I would say yes and I'd also say they mini nuked Fallujah because they couldn't win in Fallujah. I mean, the guy that the mom in Fallujah was handling the Marines there and whooping them, and then they just went and melted the whole city. Wow! I mean, just melted Fallujah, man. I mean, they they that's what they did in Fallujah should. Ooh, 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 ooh. But the, that's what we do, and that's what we did in Japan when we couldn't beat them, right? We nuked them. So I yeah. mean. It's, it's incredible, it's, but that's that absolute, incredible. yeah, it really is. And and there's some other stories of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, they they have the shadows on the wall statue uh, museum in, in Iraq, you know, where, where you know, when when you get hit with something that hot and that radioactive, your body just carbonizes, right? Right. And they have shadows on the wall of these human beings that basically just got carbonized right up against the wall from 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 you know, I mean, a bomb doesn't do that. Right. You know, just a regular old bomb that dumps a crater does not do that. You have to have an above ground detonation. You have to have all kinds of other things happening, and and it sure looked like we were doing a lot of that real early in those real early in the in the war. Yes, no, I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, it's just, it's just like so much stuff happened in Iraq that never made it back. I mean, the second war and just the stuff you're talking about it never made it back to the American people. The totality of the stuff. I mean, essentially, how many Iraqis died in the second Gulf War? Two million, one million. 
Um, Jeez, you know, and that's just that's a yeah, that's a conservative count. You know, yeah. I yeah, you're right. It was it was genocide of a country that had women on its cabinet. It was multi-religious. I mean, Tariq Aziz, Saddam Hussein's right hand man, is a Christian. You know, so. Um, yeah. This nonsense that there was a Muslim nation that was getting ready to start a jihad against us was just horse pucky. Yeah, it was baloney. They were exhausted after seven years of war. I mean, it wasn't like, a, I mean, they may have experienced people, but what they bolted up as in Time Magazine or Newsweek was, I don't think, close to the truth. I mean, you don't, you don't really get no. it. They, they made Saddam Hussein a boogeyman. In a lot of ways, the CIA created Saddam Hussein, if I remember correctly. So it's very strange kind oh, of history. Oh, yeah. I, I think he was on the payroll, and I think yeah. because Bush, you know, George Bush Sr. is the only guy who ever ran the CIA who was an outsider. He was the first outsider to ever take over the CIA, so I'm pretty sure. And, you know, he did it to Noriega in 89 in Panama before we went to before we went to the desert. I was on Fort Benning when we went down to Panama. We lost yeah. some guys down there, and um, he did the same thing to Noriega. Noriega was on their payroll, too, you know, but once they disagree with him, you know. Gets taken out. I knew a guy who... who I knew a guy who was a helicopter gunner for uh, that Noriega thing. He said it was all covered up, man. He said that they, when they went in, to, I can't remember the main city of Panama. He said, no, you didn't stop shooting. He said they just had these guns out the side and just shot anything that moved, man. He has no idea yep. how many people died. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and then you got, uh, there's a movie called Panama Deception. Yep. And uh, you got Roberto Duran, the boxer, right? And he's in the video, and he's like, man, you guys melted my city. I think he's talking about Panama City or, you know, wherever. He's like, yes, melted my city because they got, like, little wood shacks down there. And some say that was a, a little test of a depleted uranium bomb that, that before we took him over to the desert. Not surprised. So, I mean, you're seeing these use of high-tech, high-intensity weaponry that, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to, really want to get into that other uses of those types of <laughs> devices but um uh we are at about 40 minutes i mean i'd love to talk with you in greater detail about what happened after kind of you left the military because i bet that's when it gets even more interesting but for people who want to reach out to you or if you have social media or anything i missed really in the next five minutes that we've got please go ahead and uh, share that Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not that hard to find. If you type my name in there, you can find a couple music albums I put out. I put out one, the first album I put out was Support the Truth and put a book out alongside it, both called Support the Truth. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area as a punk rocker, so I'm kind of a DIY kid that way. I self-produced everything, self-published it, and then I went out on the road for quite a few years, you know, using the book and the CD at five bucks a pop to get on the bus and go from town to town to tell them about my military experience. And uh, those albums are still out there. And, uh, you know, I mean, all you got to do is uh, type my name in there. I've had the same cell phone number since, uh, like, you know, 2001, and, you know, and I have the same email address. It's all out there some way. I'm not a hard guy to find. My last name's K-Y-N-E. And um, I always make myself available for young people who we can keep from joining the military. Um, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not anti anybody who wants to, you know, uh, be a loving protector of living creatures. But um, our military has been totally hijacked to, to do some stuff that is not not cool with anybody who has any type of soul or spirit. You know, we've been hijacked to, to basically become the uh, the expansion, the expansion guys for the supply routes for the American the American machine is really all. We just out expanded right. supply routes for them. And it's probably and, uh, been that way since always, yeah, yeah, been that way since World War One. Yeah, probably. no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I think uh, all the old generals, even from Dwight Eisenhower to you know Smedley Butler, have been telling us to keep an eye on this thing, and we just we took our sight off of it for too long. And I think, um, but it's important now with the climate we're in now, where there's so much divisiveness in this country over what even appears to be some pretty petty stuff, but the divisiveness is real and. And I think it goes back to a society who's being militarized and being programmed itself, and they don't even know it. You know, I think the society we live in has, has been uh, has has had the Pavlovian stuff done via the the TV. You know, medium is the message. Marshall McLuhan told us, and I think our society really needs to to get some alternative looks at what has been happening to them rather than for them. And if, and that's what I'm trying to help out with now is help people understand that no. 
you may be intelligent and you may be beautifully educated, but you don't understand what they did to you. You keep thinking they're doing things for you. And uh, I'm kind of bent on that, that t- type of script right now. Cool, man. Well, that's a great way to end it. Uh, very, very well said. Again, the name is Dennis Kind. Dennis, K-Y-N-E. If you want to reach out to him, I can get his email address. Do you have an email address, Twitter, or Facebook, or are you off social media? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm on Facebook, and okay. I'm on Instagram, oh, and cool. um, I'm on, uh, you know, and I'll get a web page back up there. I always had DennisKind.com. It's going to come back around soon. I just, uh, you know, you know how that goes. I do. I do. Very, very well. Yeah. All right, there's man. all kinds of documentaries out there. You can look them up. Cool. And the ones that you mentioned was Beyond Treason, and then the other was... Uh, well, I mentioned Panama Deception, Panama but Deception. I'm not in that one. Okay. But there's a there's soldier speak out and Baghdad rap, um, you know. But there's a listing out there, you know. The IDMB movie sites got all me up there with all my movies on it that I'm in. <laughs> but I well, appreciate your time. Man. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate your time, man. Message, man. I appreciate the same. Great interview, man. Great information, and you're very well spoken. I'd love to have you back sometime in the future. All right, we'll do it, man. You all have right. a good one. You as well. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Take care.